Yo. Palo Santo would. What? Palo Santo. Palo Santo. Uh, actually, you're somewhat Pal- familiar with it. Uh, Ethan and Catherine had this at their house before, mm. so they both lit it before we did our present or mm-hmm. <laughs> before we did our our episodes. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's kind of, it kind of smells like frankincense. It's kind mm-hmm. of a, you know, people use it to get when they're meditating or doing spiritual things. Mm. Or I just like the smell of it. Mm. I do use it when meditating. But um, what's it do for you when you meditate? I think it's just a one of those um, memory or memory smell is a good memory trigger. Mm-hmm. And so it just kind of gets me ready. To it's meditate. a good, it's a, it's, it's also a good, uh, you know, activating a sense actively. Yes. Where, where, One that I don't lean on regularly. Yeah. Especially sense, which uh, taps deep into your, into your memory banks. Memory. Yeah. All right. Well, that's cool. <laughs> Welcome to the More In Common podcast. This is a place where we can explore the fact that we have more in common than which divides us by anchoring humanity and compassion in conversation. I'm your host, Abe Mora, coming to you virtually from Flavor, Florida, representing the My 180 crew, innovators in the hip hop scene for b-boying to graffiti, DJing and MCing. And tonight I'm happy to introduce today's show. Now, remember, you can find all things More in Common at moreincommonpod.com. There are episodes, merchandise, blogs, and more. Of course, if you like what you hear, give them a like in your favorite podcast app. Leave us a review. It helps promote the show and get more ears on these amazing conversations. Even better, if you leave us a review, we will try to read it on a future show. So please share. On today's episode, as a part of a 2020, a decade is possible. This is season three of Pursuit. And today we're with the guys from Pen Click Crew, David and Daniel. Now, if you wish to learn more, you can drop two or three lines in your sentiment about the conversation in the link below at pre-click with more in common. Now, these fellas are outstanding and bring great conversation. In today's episode, we're going to talk about who they are and what they bring. Their threads and lines, discussing... Daniel's poem and weight, the battle and weight in society, and the pen click original story. From battle rap to poetry slams, wanting to influence the poetry game with their vision and their mission. Spirituality and religion, searching for personal alignment of what is God, perceiving God, roots of all perspective, visual poetry, and the accessibility to do so. Enjoy today's amazing conversation with David and Daniel. Uh, that's why I use things like bless, blessed and God blessed because they're colloquially uh, understandable and people then relate to me in that way and it's like oh this person is being led by something bigger than themselves which i am uh that happens to be of my own device right i understand that god is of your own individual device and it's for you to define and ultimately um whether that's uh god is some uh energy or (laughs) some uh, metaphysical or astrophysical or quantum physical like some kind of huge thing scientific thing that's happening or god is uh your morning prayer and your sunday worship uh as long as you're using those things to do the work then that's what i think is the ultimate point welcome back today we are with the hosts of the pen click podcast that's click with a q u e daniel he's in Kuya, David Lazaro. Pen Click is the laboratory where poetry and pixels combine to produce lively podcasts, stunning visuals, hype fashion, and cracking live events. They're exploring the digital frontier to help carve the best paths for online poets to get seen, heard, and supported. Now, David is a dream chaser, a food taster, a tech major, a rhyme slayer, a graphic tailor, a picture taker, and a magic maker. He's the executive creative director of Pen Click a senior art director in the entertainment 
uh, advertising industry and a spoken word head of 10 plus years. His goal is to use his professional skill set to make online poetry engaging, fun, and accessible for the modern audience. Now, Daniel is a spoken word artist and producer working throughout L.A.'s poetry scene and internationally via radio, TV, and internet. He hopes to expose new audiences to the power of poetry and art. Thanks for joining us, fellas. You're yep. yeah. Thank, thank you. you Bless. Keep Bless you to have uh, the shit out of have files. you and um inviting us to get on your show, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a long overdue, but I think the time you know things happen when they're supposed to, mm-hmm. and uh, the time is right. Yeah, like, on a lot of levels, I think to connect with y'all. So, uh, really appreciate it. I, I had this idea when Keith was reading that. We should give him some like poetry and have him read it, and get, we'll get the like whitest read ever. <laughs> oh, we could do like a hashtag poetry review, bro. <laughs> yeah, we could do a live. We could do the whole thing. There you um, go. But Keith, you so, ha- I know you have an amazing question you want to start this with. So first, first question. So you got to forgive me for this, but in the spirit of pen, pen click and in honor of your platform, the first question is for you, Daniel, and okay. and it's not not an offense to you, David. It's just the way it worked out because. I want to talk about what you guys do, and that's threads and lines, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I, for our audience, uh, this is what PenClick is all about. They pull lines from a poet's work to find out what the threads of life experience is that tie together those lines of poetry. Wow. So, that's so witty. That's, that's so witty. Thing, that's, so witty. that's so witty. Thing. Yeah, I'm a word for somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> tight. Yo, that sounds hella. Yo, oh, that's Barnes. It's like, yo. <laughs> I like what he said. Wait, I wrote yeah, those. You did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, in October at the P- Pomona Valley Poetry Slam, Daniel, you had an amazing uh, performance. Um, oh, they pulled um, receipts on me, dog. And, <laughs> hey, listen, it's got it's got seven views on YouTube. I think I'm I'm nine of them, right? All right um, God bless. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Um, it was definitely deep. Now at the beginning, so forgive me for for giving this a try. Hopefully, I do it justice. But you you pulled a you have a line in there. These words written with fingers sticky from chocolate, eaten mm. to distract the hands from hurting. This back is breaking under the weight of eating away your own health. The whole performance is about the battle that so many have with weight and the societal pressures as well as the personal struggle. This line, though, like especially distract the hands from hurting. Where does that come from for you? And what is that struggle for you now? Yurt, so I have really, it's really specific too, because luckily yeah. that is like a super specific poem that is meant as therapy. Um, a lot of spoken word is therapeutic, and we are trying to wrestle with these realities that we have to live with. Uh, but so I broke my back whenever I was 16 years old. Oh, um, I was run over by an Econo line van. And I shattered my L3 vertebrae. So I had uh, an L2 to L4 fusion. Um, Luckily, I can walk, right? Uh, But I live in a constant discomfort. I am certifiably crippled. You know what I'm saying? Like, I have a mean limp. Uh, I have a lot of atrophy. And, like, I didn't... uh, It's not all there, right? Like, there are major medical issues that I deal with every single day. Um, Part of that led me to a point where I got fat, right? Like I got depressed. I was just in that rut, right? That, uh, mm. that place that where a lot of us are stuck in where we're using food and we're, um, being led to food as a means of comfort mm-hmm. and a means of joy and a means of getting away and all of that. So I got fat. I got like pretty big. I got like, like pushing 300 pounds and with a broken back with that surgery, you can't be that big. So the What's doctor you before, like, uh, Just this, this is like my walk around weight. This has always kind of been my build and my frame. Like I've never been a thin dude. I've always been like a fairly athletic, like chubby dude, if you will. Yeah, um, yeah, word. Uh, so like 285 was kind of like my real oh shit moment. And then the doctor was like, you have to have, you have to address this now because your back's fucked up and it's the, this mm-hmm. weight is, uh, adding to the problem. Oh, wow. So, um, that led to me addressing a lot of issues, right? Like, why am I in this position? Why did I let myself get to this point? You know, uh, I've known what my care personally needed to be this whole time for my health issues. And why have I not been doing it for years? And I had to really like address those issues. So, uh, with that came like wait first, right? Like that's the first place for, to start. I feel like for a lot of us, um, to mindfully eat, if nothing else, to address the issues of food because health is where it starts, right? And 
food is health, right? That's it's going to lead to or take away from your health. So that poem was written after losing um, most of my weight. My goal weight is 200 pounds. That's what I set out to. I'm about wow. 215, 210 right now. Good and I've kind of, yeah, God bless. And um, we see a lot in spoken word and in the arts, especially now empowering people with like the body positivity movement. And I'm all for that. But I wanted to like share, especially as a man, like, yo, this is fucking hard, bro. Like, yeah. This is hard. We're programmed to do this. Like the the odds are stacked against us. And those two lines, though, specifically really do reference um, all of that history. So wow. um, words written with fingers sticky from chocolate eaten to distract the hands from hurting really does hearken to that situation where I was like, I don't want to do the hard PT and the hard physical like things I need to do and the diet and exercise that I need to do because I was angry that I was in this position. Right. Like you're a crippled 25 year old man, like, cause, and it's partially your fault. You feel me? Like it was a weird accident and I had some hand in it. Right. Uh, van surfing kids don't fucking oh, van surf don't, van surf, yeah. don't go ride the whip. No, I was going to ask the you whip. Got ran over by a van. How'd that yeah, happen? The but, yeah. The tour van, the homies tour yeah, van. Public service announcement announcement. Don't do it. Yeah. And I have a piece about yeah. that as well. And like, um, I wanted to offer that transparency to men too. Like, yo, you know what? Some of us are struggling with it and some of it yeah. is hard. And like, it is hurting, but, uh, that really is just to set up that pain. Like, yo, I'm trying to show the audience, like, yo, here it is. Like, here's me hurting. Here's my pain. <laughs> a real, it, like a real quick tangent. How do y'all feel about the body positivity movement? You, you, you alluded to it a minute ago, but like, I think as long as we're being completely transparent, it's wonderful. I think that like, we should not judge people about what their bodies look like. Yeah. And it, it, inevitably, that is because of life decisions. Right. Uh, fat and happy is a viable option, and it should not affect your thought process on that human person as an individual, as an employee, as a, a human being, as a partner, as a peer. Uh, their life choices should not affect your thinking about them. Their works and who they are and the service they do to the community uh, and what they do in the community, I think, is what you should be focused on. So I think as long as like we're also being transparent on the other side, right? Like with fat and happy comes certain consequences and you need to be honest about that struggle too. You need to be honest about the whole thing uh, because I think that's the answer to everything, right? Like if we were all just more vulnerable and less uh, insensitive, like a lot of things would change rapidly for a lot of people. Yeah, um, because the people we care about and love, we want to see them for for a long for longer, time, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, you know what they say, uh, um, there's a lot of old people, there's uh, there's a lot of fat people, but there's not a lot of old fat people. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, um, you can, you know, like, uh, yeah, like, um, their work in their community it should be, like, you know, if that guy is, like, like a dope bricklayer, the best, fastest bricklayer in the world, but he's, like, hella overweight, or, or he got, like, a fucked up arm or whatever, like, you know, it is what it is. Like, that does not devalue him as, like, a bricklayer. Like, he's the mm-hmm. fastest Mason guy yeah. out there. But, yeah. um, like, how long is he going to be operating at, you know, as the fastest bricklayer with, with his weight issues right. or whatever, with whatever issues? So, um, like, yes, there is, like, um, there's a lot of strength in overcoming uh, body issues. But at the same time, like, yo, we love you. And it's like, I want, I want you to be in my, in, my, like, in, in my life, in the life of, you know, my future kids. And, uh, you know, um, I look at that myself as, as someone who's like, you know, like who, who's been on the, on, the, on the weight journey, you know, on and off, on and off, on and off. It's like, damn, like I'm facing that, uh, that um, crossroads in my life where like, yo, uh, I will have kids so, you know, eventually within, you know, pretty soon, whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yo, I got to get fit for my kids because, you know, I want to be there for their lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's what you said about transparency is so big because the part about, you know, just do you be whatever you want, like, cool, but there are consequences. Like, yeah, and be honest. Because there are people that. who say like you can be healthy and morbidly obese. It's like no, no. There's, there's literally you cannot. Like, there, yeah. there are consequences. You are not healthy. Word. But not. But then there's also mental health. Like, yeah. if you hate yourself. That's, that's like if you hate yourself and have an eight pack. That's not healthy. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, because you're killing yourself trying to eat or not eat or, or insulating yourself. You know what I'm saying? Right, like that's a thing. I, th- I mean, I think that's huge. Like <clears throat> yeah, my the, own personal the, journeys of hating my body and being in shape. It's like, what's the point? Like, what's the reason? 
Like, why yeah. am I doing that? You got a yeah, six-pack for nothing. Out of it. <laughs> yeah, word. Yo, <laughs> shout out to everyone who, who can fucking, like, blast on their abs all day only to be in a, uh, in a cubicle for, like, 10 hours a day every day. So, yo, you got an eight-pack for nothing, for bro. Nothing. <laughs> hey. You press middle, like, coffee and what? We had a we had a guest. She, uh, Megan, she was in the fitness industry. Like, not bodybuilding, yeah. but, you know, the fitness model. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And she was just like, I hated myself. Like, yeah, yeah word. She was, like, 2% body fat, looking mm-hmm. like an, a female Adonis. And, and that's, I mean, it's a great micro culture of that and the shame that can come from not being good enough because we're comparing or told we have to be a certain thing. And like in that ecosystem, you are told what you need to look like. And if you are this much off, you are feeling it, let alone how we treat the, the visual of overweight. It's like, yeah. you're, you're not, you don't look the part you need to get better. It's like, no, you, be like you said. If if that's how you're happy, you're happy. Just know the consequence. I want you around longer, and I want you to be healthy. Yeah, and like, quite work. honestly, like there are bigger people who are healthy inside. Mm. Like yeah. you know, so Far judging probably they they could be healthier than someone who's you know ripped up and shredded in bodybuilding, right? Um, but I appreciate well, we're also you sharing about, that too. We're also only talking about you know the, the fat side. There's also like the that's skinny right. struggle, which yeah, like. Yeah. Where, I don't know shit about I'm that. I'm ignorant too. Yeah. <laughs> tell me, tell him. I've never been that. It's been, I was 10 when I was that skinny. Men, yeah. You talk about struggle for men. Like but a lot yeah. of times eating disorders <laughs> only get covered from the female angle. I grew up wrestling. Yeah. Um. I grew up wrestling in Indiana. That's. It's oh, like, I see that, bro. I see that. Well, wait, where, where, where are you at? Huh. Bro, like when I start freshman, <laughs> freshman like year. Like I slid that. It's like, yo. I used to do a little heavyweight fucking around. Freshman you know? year, I wasn't, I didn't even weigh 100 pounds. Like, oh wow! I didn't even, I didn't even weigh. Oh, that's 90, good though. So you were doing good. Three, that's perfect. She was the lowest class when I started. So you were smashing. So I was cool, but then like I, then I was like, I hit the weight room. Yeah, and yeah. Then I started cutting from like my senior year. Oh. I weighed one forty playing football. Okay. And then I cut to uh, one twenty five. Yeah, where? Okay. In like weeks. That's a and good. Like, that's a good weight range though for high school wrestling. For man. sure. Yeah. yeah, and it was very doable, but it, the way I did it was not healthy. And I oh, look like back sweat under the, yeah. like, like sweating under the mask. Trash like, bags. Oh, trash trash bag runs. <clears throat> running at Thanksgiving, Saunas. eating like just sips of broth. Mm-hmm. And like, I look Chewing at gum it and now, spitting out. I mean, talking in therapy now, like I had a fucking eating disorder. Yeah, like, we're I had facts. an eating disorder. Yeah, and, full and blown. because of it, like I still struggle with issues on how I look at my body. Yeah. And like, and, and men, like we have the vision, the Adonis, the NFL player that we're supposed to look like. That I think affects us in different ways than it tends to affect some females, but it's, it's there and it's real. Yeah, when every team will, uh, every time I do that piece publicly, I have at least one male, uh, usually like 30 to 45, come to me and be like, yo, thank you, man. Cause like, yeah, I feel you. Like, I'm in th- right there too. That was I'm me like, uh, at the, at the, at the uh, Lion Like Mind State Slam <laughs> where Daniel performed that and, and like, like all the judges like gave him like sevens. I'm like, and look at, looking at all the judges, like, dog, no, skinny and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, word. Y'all don't y'all get don't it. Know. Y'all don't y'all know. Y'all know the struggle. Hey, real quick, shout Fuck out Line here. Like Mind State. Shout out IE. Shout out Pomona Poetry. Y'all shout out. out here. Uh, but yeah, bro. But I was like, like, yo, that hit me, God. That hit me. But because in Slam, uh, you can't know the poet. Otherwise, they'll get the squad. Yeah, yeah. You, you score them. So. Uh, that makes By sense. the way, uh, uh, rewinding uh, real quick uh, um, to when Daniel was talking about uh, like that Thursday Lines piece. Yes. Um, Colloquial, colloquially, when we say peace, that's referring to a poem being performed. Oh, I appreciate. So every that. time, every time it says peace, it's like it's talking about a poem. Not, not a, not a piece. Nah, not, 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 not a queer thing. Not oh no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. All right, so look, I not the yapper. Lots of questions, but the first, I want to go kind of to the beginning of Pin Click, and probably we're gonna go back beyond that a little bit. But you mentioned to Keith and I a few days ago that. You two are very different human beings. Mm-hmm. And that were it not for this endeavor, you wouldn't be in the same circles. Maybe. I don't know. Like Likely would. Well, I don't know. First of all, like ge- uh, geographically, right? Like you're IE. I'm like, I'm. Uh, that's LA. Inland Empire LA. for all y'all non SoCalians. Yeah, yeah. I'm Northeast LA. Uh, but, and, but then, like, I, I don't know. Like, because like, I feel like like our waves in, in the poetry scene have been, like, you know, off sync of each other. Like when you were, you, when you were like uh, slamming, slam is competitive poetry performing. And uh, slam, um, poetry slam, not slam poetry, but poetry slam is a competition of poets performing poems, which are graded out of ten, and it is a bracket tournament system. So yeah, when you were in your when you were in your uh, your whole like, like uh, slam wave, like I was just not, I was just not uh, you know, attending. Mm-hmm. And then when you fell off, like I started coming back in. So yeah, like we were. So even even like in our in our poetry shit, like even though that's what we share, 
I feel like we were off wave on that too. We got community linked up. Yeah. So um, it was somebody was just like, "Y'all need to talk." Or, oh yeah. yeah. So let's somebody, give him the origin story. Yeah, hit him. Cool. Yeah, what do you you know about right, so, the, like, pre, um, pre 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 pre? Uh, I like like uh, I really so like I, I really follow um battle rap rap battles right. So like you know King of the Dot URL Smack um all that. And I always thought that like the the battle rap system like so battle rap has evolved to the current technology way better than poetry slam ever has because like um like as you know um because it's it, it's coming from hip hop a hip hop background like and uh, um hip hop artists rappers are always trying to you know uh, figure out how to promote themselves best they're always you know attaching themselves Very to hustle, much the grind and the hustle right. to figure out what's, like, what 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 technology allows them to, to proliferate yeah. yeah so from MySpace to YouTube, to uh, SoundCloud, whatever, yeah, whatever. My right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so on top of that, like, uh, uh, so, so that um, grind and um, and uh, combining technology to proliferate yourself uh, um, paradigm was also attached with the evolution of battle rap, how, how like um, rap battles weren't just in the room, but as soon as someone had like a digital camera and they could you know record that um, off of their flip phone onto MySpace, mm -hmm. so you get a beautiful 120p frosty like like a. Uh, uh, each pixel is like is actually five inches, you know, kind of yeah, yeah. kind of video off of mcbattles.com. Yo, there's like two people uh, like out of all your listeners that are just dying listening to this. Yeah, but yeah, right. uh, but uh, on off of mcbattles.com off your uh, real video player. Yeah, and I always thought that like like the way um, battle rap and hip hop evolved with the technology was far superior to what poetry was doing. It was kind of stuck in this live uh, live event only kind of thing, mm -hmm. and then only later like people like Button Poetry would like upload single videos and performances, but still not in a very like engaging um way or with a narrative that makes sense mm -hmm. to, you know, to new audience. But in battle rap, they did that because, you know, like they would like, you know, upload they would do like, you know, promo pieces. You could go to each rapper's MySpace just to see like like, like who would uh, like, like, you know what they're all about. And then uh, and then like they have all three uh, all three rounds of the battles and then they would promo those uh, those videos on different platforms. Uh, uh, um, so um, that evolved to what we have today, where, where you know it's, it's YouTube drops, pay per views, even Smack now has an app for all that. Amazing, and um, I wanted to, I want Poetry Slam, uh, competitive poetry, uh, to have the same paradigm, have a similar paradigm. So I wanted to test that idea. What if we had you know like a head to head battle, uh, head to head poets go up, clash against each other? We call it the Poetry Clash. And the idea is that, like, in Poetry Slam, it's kind of a wonky system because, you know, you take, uh, you know, 10 poets from round one and then, like, you know, four make it to round two and then two make it to round three and then you have a top winner. All scored on a 10 point. All system. scored out of 10. But I think, it, but the problem with, you know, that tournament style is that, like, you know, once score creep is real, score creep is a, is a natural phenomenon that occurs when, like, uh, score, like, people just judge, like, Yeah, there's all high. kinds of holes in it. Yeah, like, there's, yeah. there's all types of holes in it. And... And uh, the, the the poetry slam system was never meant. But the battle rap this. system is very clear. Right. Exactly. Which person gets the most cheers in the audience? Yeah. You right. feel me? And like everybody, you can. It's objective. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ish. 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 I mean, at least the scoring system is right. fairly objective. Whoever's because, like, loudest an observer gets it. Can tell who got. No, not with. necessarily because no? because uh, there's also preference. Right, yeah, so yeah. Uh, so, oh, in, so in the in the online in the uh, so the, in modern battle rap, there's um there's two ways of judging. There, there's uh, uh in the building and on camera, is what they call it. In the building, if you're in New York and uh, and you're a Cali dude versus a, uh, versus a dude who's like playing home, yeah, and then like that dude's getting all of his homies and just like you know going wild, just giving hella gas, uh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But then like you know, on camera, if you like you know people from like. From from England, from the Philippines, from South Africa, they're like, no, nah, like the the Cali That's new, new. Got that's it, new, new. Right? That's a new, new. Anyway, so, uh, so so going back, um, I wanted to test out the idea of like um of simplifying the narrative instead of like, you know those ten poets against and building this new other, paradigm, right? Building a new paradigm, I want to simplify it down to one poet versus one poet, simplifying the narrative, and I needed uh, poets to test the idea. One was recommended to me via uh, Charles Williams, who ran um, See, Will? Speech Thursdays. Uh, in Hollywood, um, and he recommended uh, Mr. Daniel Hees over here, who was um, in, like, in the tail end of his slam wave, I think. I didn't even really slam, so uh, and yeah, Kuya did that with uh, Alex Alfaro, yeah. so that was the other poet that he oh, secured. So he's it was, been featured on the podcast. Yeah, yeah he's uh, a day one, he's, he's a pen-click family, he's yeah. Money. 
So he was, that was the day. So I had been, uh, a Mike and Dim Lights is a open mic in Pomona, California. God bless Dim Lights family strong. Um, 20 years. So we're actually uh, wrapping it up. Uh, I host that now and I help facilitate it. But uh, JB and Best Kept uh, started that mic 20 years ago, a poetry mic in Pomona because it was needed, right? So uh, they've been doing that 20 years. I come from that school and I wanted to, Best was like, yo, you could do this. You're good at poems. And I was like, what, dog? All right, cool. I'll go do that. What do I do? And he was like, go hit every mic you can for as long as you can, right? Like, just get out there. So I was like, all right, cool. So I just hit four or five open mics a week for a year, essentially, and then uh, started slamming. Uh, DPL, the Poetry Lounge. Uh, One of the biggest open mics in L.A., if not the nation. It's an amazing experience. If you're in L.A. and have not gone, go. It's I Tuesday nights. Too, yeah, yeah, the Greenway Dude, That's Way where, Court like, Theater. slam champions go to open Yeah, we'll mic. go, Rodney. We'll hit you up. We'll, yeah, we'll plan dude. a little thing. Um, so that's like the main stage in LA though. That's like the biggest, uh, one of the most trying things you could do as a poet in LA, like to really test your clout. It's so premiere mic. Yeah. Sure, word, word, sure. word. So I started slamming there, uh, more with uh, the intention again of like honing a craft and kind of like, all right, cool. If I'm going to do this, let's figure out how to do this by doing it. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of just said yes to every single opportunity that ever came along, right? You're getting reps. So I was getting a lot, and people were like, Daniel shows up. You know what I'm saying? Daniel will come through. Daniel will fucking come oh, out. Daniel, and he's good. He's reliable. bars. Yeah, exactly. yeah, so he's yeah. like, Daniel shows up early, and he's bars. You're good. So C. Will, uh, Kuya hit C. Will, like, yo, uh, you interested in doing this? And he was like, no, but Daniel will. And sure enough, I was yeah. like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do this. And then that yeah, day... We do this clash, right, which I lost because of bias, but uh, we'll see. what's up, Alex? <laughs> what's up, Alfaro round two? What's up, fam? Um, because of bias? But, uh, bias is real. We way. both brought bars, though, and that was dope. Like uh, That instantly bonded me and Alex to where it was like, damn, bro, Like we were both on that wave where it was like we, we had that conversation, and then later I would have it with Kuya the same day where it was like, yo, why isn't this happening on a – why isn't this also like um, – the what's happening in rap battle like literally me and kuya i think had that conversation to some degree like yo why isn't more shit like this happening uh at the time recently g-shock put like put on this huge rap battle event and it blew my mind like yo bro what we if g-shock's willing to put 50 100 150k into this rap battle we could probably get like g-shock to put like 5k into some poetry shit yeah. you feel me and that was really like my thought process going into just into the scene like as a producer i had worked in industry and as an audio engineer in a lot of different avenues and i coming into poetry as a performer um was cool because i was used to like punk bands and music growing up and this offered me an opportunity to perform wherever whenever easily and the producer in me was like yo but i want to do this podcast because there's no content out there there is no good poetry anything to speak of so whenever me and Kuya come together and I meet this person who's like, yo, I'm trying to do this with video. And I was like, yo, I've had this podcast idea for a minute. Like, what's up? And that was I mean, the, the day. It's so money because like when I hear poetry, I think iambic pentameter. Like literally, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah, Shout word. out Willie Shakes. <laughs> Willie yeah, Shakes. Um, man, so so is that where this is going? No, a lot of it. So like, it's like to try and find a way right. to make poetry like they create that rap battle yeah not only that like that, that's that's just like one of the so there's essentially like four or five pillars of careership in poetry um one one is um competitive poetry um another one is featuring another one is um is uh publishing like like, uh, like books and stuff and another one is teaching mm-hmm. right so um pen click like while we are primarily a poetry podcast at the same time we also um have ideas of having our own spin on each of these pillars mm-hmm. so um so for for with entertainment with entertainment so being the the, the driving right. force right because we both grew up in the hip hop community Facts. where it was like even in backpack because we both like OG backpackers you know what I'm saying um, you could be all lyrical miracle all day but if you're not entertaining if you're if you're not spinning over a dope beat nobody gives a fuck yeah why, word yeah I mean we could go talk about tribe we could talk about right. Black Star, like yeah, all amazing, but all like the that. entertainment value. The musicality. Like, I, sit the shop, I sit in the shop in Inglewood, yeah. and they're like, "Man, that nigga's whack," like because yeah. he doesn't have the beats or like, right. like it's not as fun, right? Right. Um, but what he's saying is like actually, right? Damn, like bar. Yeah, word, word. And we wanted to like bring that to poetry, like yo. Because ultimately, like, G-Shock ain't going to put on some iambic pentameter shit. And it wasn't, that wasn't what poetry was. People think poetry is something 
outside of the community that it's not. And the truth of it is, is it's vast and it's reaching, right? And there's a lot of different material out there and a lot of different kinds of poets. Like I try and be very subversive and like, I like to push buttons and I like to shake shit up and I like to make people laugh. You know what I'm saying? Like I like to be entertaining in my poetry um, or uh, something. Right. And we wanted to show that too. Like, yo, poetry doesn't have to be, iambic pentameter on all four of these like in these tiers like we were saying like uh that doesn't need to be restricted to these old white people talking about poetry because that's what poetry podcasts were it was old stuffy people even if they were talking like dope artists that we like shout out to poetry foundation yo 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 if you you, you have insomnia if you have insomnia yo a poetry foundation podcast oh Oh, that, that's your cure, but 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 that's no that's fire. That's but no that, shade to BS though. BS, up, though. BS poetry podcast is the truth. Shout out Dennis Smith. Yeah, shout, shout out to Freddie all fucking day. But fucking uh, uh, poetry off the shelf. Fuck out. And now we see poets like Dan S. Smith doing that and stepping into this um, multimedia oh, yeah, like, realm. Yeah, no, keep that in the edits. What? <laughs> yeah, we uh, we have this like shared vision of like how do we revolutionize poetry ultimately to put poets on right? Like why? I come into the scene, right, and you see the pinnacle of spoken word, and you're kind of, it was kind of unimpressive to me, like, to be honest, like, yo, I can't even pay my bills like this, you know? Right. Which like, will also me? impede people from getting into it. Exactly. It's like soccer versus it's football. All, like, why it's am I It's a whole play? cyclical thing where, like, a lot of poets drop out because um, they can't pay their bills. There's no end game. Yeah. There's no, like, there's no, like, there's no, like celebrity while I'm out, uh, celebrity poet while I'm out, like, with, like, all the girls and just, like, having uh, money conversations with like with like a money brick phone like there's there's no poets really doing that there's, but the reason why is because there's no end game to um to the poetry so, so there's no platform for that but yeah. if we build a platform where where we can turn poets into rock stars to give them real following and then uh and for that to build up for them to you know make money off of their brand and for uh, and creating the capacity for us to pay poets and yeah. that's then that's amazing that's it. and click that's is amazing. like important to us because like uh it's hard when you're building a brand to be like yo pen click and we're building this thing but the intention really is to like hopefully seed this revolution you feel me like if we do this here and y'all get your little poetry thing crack in there and y'all get your little poetry thing crack and we all can find some way to put these events on these thousand dollar two thousand three thousand dollar events where poets get paid eventually 50 150 eventually it grows to where it's like now we're actually putting poets on and the community mm-hmm. the paradigm has now is now supporting the artistry right? right like the artistry the craft ultimately if you hold artists up in that way it evolves the art uh poetry there's poetry ain't done you know what i'm saying like poetry oh. has new places to go and i want to see them go there and what i from what i've seen from y'all and just conversations prior to this like the business the design the entertainment the creativity like maybe somebody's a great poet but they don't know how to Build a brand, right? Or yeah, promote right. a brand, so you can teach them all of that. And I, I mean, I'm learning through our podcast. Like that's as, if not more important than what you're actually saying, yeah. because you want people to actually hear it. And, and that's where like Kuya right. has been. Uh, like I'm all feels and fucking God and bullshit and weed and fucking poetry and <laughs> art. You know what I'm saying? And Kuya is the one that's like, yo, I need to teach poets this part because well, they don't know. There's a book called uh, "Real Artists Don't Starve." Mm. Yeah, facts. And it's like because I think we're all. I'll speak for myself. I was taught that like to be an artist, to be like you're gonna starve, and yeah. then when you're dead, you'll be famous. Mm. But I don't. But like this book is a is a painter, and she wrote it. She's like, that's not true. Like, right. If if you know how to promote yourself and build a business just as legit and functioning as any corporation, then you won't. Like that's not. So I see. I I absolutely see y'all doing that. Like, Connects with the vision. I connect. You hear that on uncommon podcast listeners. They connect with the <laughs> click vision. Know what it is. But that's why it's click. click for a reason. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a team effort. We're trying to, like, do something together. We couldn't do what we're doing without everybody in this, the country, really, right now. Like, we reach across the globe right now, bro. You just More mentioned, poetry. like, you're all feels and God. And in and, and the prelude, because we don't include the rapid fire in the actual episode. But, like, oh. in the prelude, you were like, you're an atheist Buddhist. Which, yeah. so like when I first, the first time I talked to you, the first thing I said is like, how are you? And you said, blessed. And then when I walked up to your crib here in a, a, a while ago, you said the same thing. So I'm thinking, okay, spiritual background. I don't know like what deity or whatever. And then you say atheist Buddhist. And I was like, oh, like, cause I, you know, I'm building my bias or, or thoughts of what, yeah, yeah, yeah. of what that Putting means the piece together. based on who's, who would say that in my life. And so this is a very interesting, like what's, 
I'm just curious, like a little piece of that journey. Like, what does it mean to be an atheist Buddhist to you? Uh, so like that was the resolution after years and years of search, uh, long story, long, long, long reaching story that involves a lot of drugs and epiphanies and fucking (laughs) studies and books and things, uh, started out young, wanted to be a pastor, studied to be a pastor for some time in my preteen years, uh, leaning into my teen years, 15 years old, got my heart broken because I read the Quran and shit. I was starting to like reach outside my faith and mm-hmm. question and things like that because I was studying to be a pastor, right? Um, and uh, the girl I was dating, I got mad bugged out and like- Because you read the Quran? Kind of, yeah, things like that. It wasn't literally that, but it was like, oh, you're you're just meddling, right? Like you're, uh, you're you know how it is. You grew up in the Bible Belt, you know what I'm saying? You can't be doing that. You can't do that. Jesus don't read books. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Which is that actually led so me- funny because I feel like Jesus and Muhammad and- like they would all be chilling, like because they all get it. Well, yeah, that was in, it. In right? the Quran, like, it says like Jesus sits at the right hand of Muhammad in like in the afterlife. And on, like also like seeing through all that shit, like yo, uh, I I was. Buddha, they would all be chilling. Mother Teresa, they would all be chilling. Yeah, where I don't know. You hear some wild shit about Mother Teresa. Yeah, we're yeah, 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 yeah. Really? We all got our faults and flaws. But yeah. Oh sure. Um, but yeah, so uh, kind of fall away from the faith. I had some sticky church things. I'd left a church, so I was like put in a position of power at like thirteen. Like, yo, lead too, these sermons. Too young, too, too soon. And I got geeked out on it. Like, yo, I'm gonna use this to you know what I'm saying, do some fuck shit. Uh, and my pastor was like, no, some of us are called to this, so mm. don't be afraid of it. And I was like, yo, I'm out of this place, bro. Like. I'm telling you, this is unhealthy for me. And yeah. you're not smart enough to recognize that? So I find another church. Uh, that pastor leaves to go to another job. That kind of breaks my little heart. Like, fuck, bro, you were leading me on this path of humility. And cert- like, that was it for him. Like, yo, read your fucking Bible and pray. That's how you find God. That You want to know? You want to lead people you to God? You want those young man? Read your fucking Bible. Yeah, word. Uh, <laughs> and not anything else. Word. That's how I tell kids, too. Um, so that happens. I kind of fall away from Christianity and just look for years and years and years and years and years and and read and like, don't really understand God. Uh, now I use God as a place marker for like that, that is that we can't understand. So when trying to convey these concepts about like interpersonal love and connectivity and the work that needs to be done in the name of God, um, it's easier to say God. Uh, to Use people. colloquially, yeah, yeah, just because be we, we have conversations about this every now and then. Like, yeah, I'd like rather the, be effective yeah. than like have somebody. I don't care about what I think. You know what I'm saying? It's not about what I think. I don't think that what you think is wrong or what I think is wrong or right for that matter. It's just about being effective to make sure the work gets right. done. So as long as I'm being effective to get the work done, uh, that's why I use things like bless, blessed, and God bless because they're colloquially uh, understandable and people then relate to me in that way and it's like oh this person is being led by something bigger than themselves which i am uh that happens to be of my own device right i understand that god is of your own individual device and it's for you to define and ultimately um whether that's uh god is some uh energy or (laughs) some uh, metaphysical or astrophysical or quantum physical like some kind of huge so thing, days, scientific thing that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Or God is uh, your morning prayer and your Sunday worship. Uh, as long as you're using those things to do the work, then that's what I think is the ultimate point. And I learned that from Buddhism. Uh, the, the Why I identify as a Buddhist is uh, because I... Which is, for those that are confused. It's not a religion, right. particularly. There is religions. It is a f- religion. It is a faith uh, for some. But you could be like a Taoist Buddhist. Or- <laughs> Right. I mean, Christian and there's people that Buddhist, are, yeah, that, there's Zen, like, there's it's many a way schools. Of life. It's, a it's, a philosophy. it's a philosophy uh, that people do apply to like religion and spirituality um, for tradition's sake and those things. Those things are bound to happen. But uh, yeah, I don't believe in God in any conceivable. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I feel like, like, I feel like mean, that whole conversation is just like, like, you know, there's an the argument of, of, of where, where they ask uh, in order to I don't know, argue the existence of God, you first have to be able to define what is God. And yeah. and I don't even think humankind is there. Okay, and so I, use the, I use the word atheist Buddhist to challenge right. people. Like I said earlier, I like to be subversive. That's, so what, the I mean, idea, that's why I was like, wait. What yeah, that? because it is just, that idea where it's like, uh, I like. Uh, it's a good guy. Same blessed, or I'm blessed, or mm-hmm. God bless. So Keith, if if I say God bless to you, how does that make you feel? As Because you're you would identify as agnostic slash atheist. Hey, same buddy. Yeah, I wouldn't. I I would say more agnostic than atheist. Yeah, um, I believe something. Like as what. we talk about, as we talk about, um, 
you know, believing in God or whatever that means, like you were just saying, David, the whole definition of what God is. So when you say blessed, blessed to me has a religious undertone. Like that's how I receive it. So as a result, it gives me a sense of discomfort because I don't know how to receive it because I feel like I'm not going to receive it the way you mean it. Now, at the same time, that's how it feels for me internally. And I just completely disregard that because I, I, I try to take it gracefully when someone says, you know, God bless or whatever the case may be. It's like, thank you. And I say, bless you when people sneeze. So I try not to overthink it too much. Right. Um, right. But then, the, but yeah, like, so I actually try not to say it though. Like I feel blessed because I don't know if I do. But at the same time, I think I understand it when other people do right. say that, like you, like you say, it, right, Daniel? Uh, Super quick, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to, if you want to. Oh uh, no, and really, uh, whenever I say it, um, it's a recognition of like the context of human history and suffering, right? Like, I'm blessed mm. to be alive, and I'm blessed to be breathing, and like, I am blessed to be standing is to be blessed to be working is to be. Blessed. Uh, Eckhart Tolle yeah. in, um, I think it's the Power of Now. He was talking about like he doesn't use the word God a lot. But when he does use it in the book, he's like, um, I don't want you to get caught up in the word. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, exactly. Like when I yeah. say God or energy or mm-hmm. blessed, like whatever that means to you, like focus on that. Not the fact that I just said blessed. So, t- so take that. Like, David, you were about to say, like, it's how you do, like, how do you define Let me it? give y'all a real quick uh, um, <laughs> thought experiment. Right. And, um, yo, shout out agnostic atheists, because like this kind of goes up in there where um, all right. So. I always, I always use this uh, uh, this reference the story. Um, the jellyfish, right? The jellyfish. The jellyfish can't smell, hear, taste, feel. Um, all they can do is feel. They're essentially like like a floating nervous system. Yeah, so yeah, so you have the yeah. jellyfish, right? Can't smell, hear, taste. All they can do is feel. They're essentially like a floating nervous system. Yeah. Right. So imagine trying to explain the internet to the jellyfish. It's it's, it's just beyond their physical capabilities. Right? Yeah. And then, um, yeah. we are essentially a higher life form than the jellyfish. More or less, because we have more biological sensors to experience this reality. Yeah. So, with that being said, that like we are a higher life form than this jellyfish, what is God? Is God just a higher life form that has more biological sensors that, ex- that exists in like more, or, or that is aware of more planes than us? It's like, like, well, that's that's my thing. Like, maybe, I grew maybe up we that. are, maybe we are the cosmic jellyfish of the universe, and yeah, like, like, um, if there is a God, like, what is God? Right? Is like, is it just a higher life form? If if something is real, it must therefore be testable. Well, but to your example, but if we don't have the testable bi- by whom? Yeah, if we don't have if we don't have the we don't have the capabilities, then how can we test? How yeah, it? And that's like, like the restraints like, of observation, right? Like right. Uh, you'll never be able to. But at the same observe time, God. Like, like, there's, there's a lot. Of, so there's a lot of mathematical God. theories that have been proving uh, have, have been testing true on bench, on bench colloquially um, for all those listeners is like is uh, in the lab over. Um, bench, multiple yeah. tests on bench. So um, uh, there have been like multiple um, uh, mathematical theories that have been t- I'm testing true on bench like uh, recently because we now have the technologies for that. So who's in, who's to say that like in the far future if we have you know uh, technologies that can uh, you know um, that that can that can test within those like you know, fifth dimension, sixth dimension, or if string theory is correct or whatever. So for sure. so the, the, which is where agnosticism comes into play. We're like, all right, I am open to the idea that there may be more than what our current um, technology and, and uh, biological sensors can indicate. However, um, uh, current evidence been able points no. Right. So I, I, growing up in the church, like, my thing has always been, like, people are like, God wills this, or God says this, or God, and I'm, I'm like, how do we... And I'm still spiritual and religious. Mm. And I'm like, I don't understand how anybody could purport to understand the will of a being that created you or created all of this. Like, we don't even understand it's how the too local. stink bug works. Far like, too how local. How does that not explode right. every day? Think of it like this, right? So in your body, there's like trillions of, of, of life forms, of bacteria, right? Yeah. We're, so, more, we're so more bacteria for, than anything else. For, for, any, for anyone to say like that there exists like this... Um, this uh, ever-present being that gives a shit about you know you individually is like is like a, a piece of bacteria in in this part of your elbow you know in, the, in your left elbow saying oh yeah um, the 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 god a god 
cares about me. God, cool. It's like, but I think that there, there's a kinda, deeper. No, right. I think so, that there's so, a deeper example to that though, because it is like, okay, if you're a human, right? Yeah. Uh, like the E. coli in your gut, right? You need that. We're aware of like our I gut care, biome, right? So, probiotic but, health but, now but is a huge thing, right? Individually, we're doing we can because like we care, we care about we like care about our probiotic we care about our, health. Our, our, our gut flora. Yeah, yeah. We, we care about our gut flora, but not individual. About, but not individual because you can't. Aspects or pieces you of it. It's, it's far too local. It's too much for my brain. Like, yeah. but with how big the universe is, this, yo, come on. And yeah. that, Even, if that is true, and I think that that is more of the sense of God than uh, that's something me and Kuya agree upon. Like, there's probably something that we're a part of that we can't perceive. Then we all God, you know what I'm saying? This, we all part of God. God is in everything. God is all things. Illustrates to me, so we couldn't comprehend the in my in my opinion, we could not comprehend the mind of something. Like say it was one thing. It could have been uh, say say what was one thing? God. 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 Say God could be one thing. It could be a group of things. Like who knows? Like just take God and say God created this earth and this solar system and all of the solar systems. There is no way I could understand the the intelligence and the being of that so to say that it couldn't care about everything i don't know like if it could create all of it it could care about all of it i, well, I, like I you, didn't create my gut floor yeah right. you know what i'm saying like but I, you care about your i gut care floor. about my gut floor but not on an individual level yeah. I completely agree with that like, but i'm saying I, like i don't which I, explains like, the suffering the violence the shitty things that people do to each other right god can't be like yo stop that you can't right. go to your gut like, yo i'm like, over here building another here. star yeah. Yeah. like yeah. You, can't, you, you can't tell on the other you one. can't prevent your yeah, white yeah, blood yeah. cells yeah. from murdering all the bacteria that comes in you or like, sometimes yes. the other I, blood cells because they get yeah. you know murderous i i had this conversation one time with this um young woman some decade plus ago and super religious and she and I had said to her, like, this is the way I conceptualize it, right? Is if you found out one day that God didn't exist, like as an entity, um, your your entire being would be rocked. Like everything about you and your existence is 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 shattered. And she's like, Yes, that's true. Like for me, it wouldn't be. There there is this interconnectedness given the nature of where we all come from when you think about supernova, stars exploding, creating elements that ultimately led to life and that have created this complexity of, of biological existence on Earth and who knows where else considering there are trillions of galaxies and trillions of stars within each galaxy. Like and trillions upon trillions of planets that surround all of those stars. Like the if if God is the creator of all things, it, God is the creator of all those things. So therefore God, as you just put it, Daniel, is in everything. It's it's this interconnectedness to us that we feel because we share common elements. We share common existence. We may think differently. We may have different life experience, but we share much more that tie us together. If we all lived in a life that thought that's what God was that allowed us to treat everything with respect. I think David, you talked about it in the pre-show, this idea of, of empathy and, and treating people, the golden rule. I think you said to Daniel, like treat others as you wish to be treated rather than this judgment. Like there is this higher being that we manifest in our own, in our own vision that is telling us you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't live like this. You shouldn't live like that. All of a sudden, we've created this entity that judges rather than this entity that is, that ultimately ties us all together because we're all trying to do the same thing, and that's live life. And that's the way I look at God. So I don't, I don't like the word because I see it as a human being because that's yeah. what's been taught to me. And yeah, thus, yeah. I don't believe it is that, so I can't right. call it God, but I understand. So that's how I understand the spiritual component. That's why I say I'm not agnostic. But I'm certainly not atheist not, because, uh, yeah, yeah, gotcha. yeah I, I, I like I'm atheist in the sense that I don't believe God is a human, like the manifestation right. of man that imparts and says you shall not be gay, yeah. right? Yeah. Like I don't believe all that, but I do believe in in that thing that the ties us all force. together, right? And I think that that ultimately though is the result of religious oppression. Like my wife um, comes from a very Christian family, very, very Christian. And they're good Christians. You know what I'm saying? They're teetotaling. They don't drink. They don't swear. They don't smoke. They're nice, sweet people. They're bigots. You feel me? Like they don't like gay people. They're they're kind of racist in that unknowing way. You know what I'm saying? Right. Just below the surface. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the way that I explain it to like uh, – other people, uh, white folks, is like, yo, if there's two black dudes in the room, y'all know that there's two black dudes in the room. You feel me? 
Y'all know in the back of your head, yeah. you've already mm-hmm. done that math. I mean, and I know. some of us never do that math. You know what I'm saying? Because right. we're constantly surrounded by two black dudes in the room. Like, I don't fucking know, bro. I don't fucking because exposure. And anyways, she has that same reaction though. Whenever like, say I'm in meditation and like I meditate as a Buddhist and I reach some understanding with that, I will communicate that, and that's communicated in my brain as like you receive that from God, right? Or the work you do this work and you'll find right. epiphanies through this. Uh, this voice in your head that we have that doesn't really exist, that's leading our thinking. Um, that third you. thing, right? The brilliance of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, to be to able to observe your own life and those things. That's God, right? So uh, I'll go to her, though, and say that. And sometimes, like, just to annoy her, I'll tell her, like, yo, God told me today. <laughs> And she hates it because in her mind, it's like, God don't exist. Jesus is a lie and all these things. And, um, but to me, like, it's all the same. And ultimately, like what I think we're describing, the bad parts of this discussion, all are just people and religion and like how people manipulate this thing that's control. happening to yeah. yeah to utilize hey. to control or to get make money or yeah. whatever yeah, keith real quick so um you're uh yeah, man. you describe yourself as uh, agnostic semi some somewhat atheist or shades of atheist i've never really thought about myself it, as atheist, atheist until i just described the way i thought of god like all literally right. that was the first time i've ever consciously yeah. thought of myself as atheist in any way all yeah. right yeah i asked because like i, I just want to know because like um all agnostics atheists, we all have like that pivotal moment or in our lives where like it's switched for us because like a lot of us are are raised with some kind of you know, i think you started i mean yes. you weren't raised with nope. a religious but i mean house. i was raised with catholic roots but hey, um, yeah. oh were you yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, my, I read that my, yeah catholics like mom, are a lot of them my yeah. my mom was very what was the pivotal moment in your life? as a kid yeah and she just didn't she didn't put it on me she didn't force me like like my my the the heritage of my family is extremely religious but my mom rebelled against that like not all her brothers and sisters have rebelled against that and um as a result she just told me like hey i you know i got my communion when i was a kid but i was the kid in ccd like it was ccd that's what we called it i think it's called something different no, in the midwest no yeah it's still same, yeah. CD. same. Yeah, okay that just asks a lot of questions like that doesn't make sense to me that escapes logic now um was that CCD? just for disambiguation for your it's just a I wish I could. like communion. your confirmation you have to do your it's confirmation it's like your class. first first Catholic first something class diocese. that leads yeah, leads know. towards confirmation all right, all right, and right. you know you you can you can accept the Christ uh, the the body of Christ at the end of it the power basically of Christ compels you so I mean I wouldn't say there was ever a, a a singular moment. It's just been this evolution of thought that I've just always thought about it. And and there was this comedian one time who has explained it this way. He said, "You know what? If God was a golf club, I think I'd be okay with it, right? Like, you know, at the end of life, if you actually find out what that God is, and that God is a golf club, like that's cool. Like whatever that is, <laughs> I just I like well, believing in something that well, ties us all together more than anything. So you were pretty much raised with like a just like a mom that didn't like heavily enforce you. Um, to be she did not. Be Catholic. There, there like, was none. That's opposite no religious push. I was like, yeah. So yeah, like, like most Filipinos, like um, I'm culturally very Catholic. Yeah, very you Catholic, got that right? shit. But then like as a yeah, <laughs> that was like, that was forced upon you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that so, Christmas yeah. shit, bro. You blew my when, mind this Christmas. The they go to midnight mass for a week, dog. Wait. A week? Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's like a Chinese New Year celebration. It's making your it's, kids go to black, midnight mass. It's called Simbangabe, where like, like uh, oh, people go to that. church like every night for like almost like a week or so. I gotta ask my sister. It's, it's so wet. It's so trash. It is so trash. Anyway, but um, but yeah, what got me to turn on the agnostic light bulb is like just asking the question. Well, well, what did we worship before the Spaniards forced Christ upon us? Mm. And then asking those further questions, like, all right, well, um, for people who didn't know about christ um like did they because of original sin did they automatically go to hell and i'm pretty sure like there's some listeners who, who have the well actually comments but at the same time it's like who gives a shit it's like the like, their uh, the filipinos had their own mythology yeah um every as well every people right. did right like, and then yeah. and then that just like that just broke broke me open it's like oh well if that's not fully true for everybody then what is and mm-hmm. that and then just that just like uh uh curiosity just led into more rabbit holes where like now it's like all right well define what is god like what is it made of you know shit like that it was like yeah. what about yourself well what do you what would you uh identify as? I mean, I you said, said you both you said, said you're religious, religious spiritual like so 
because for me, like my framework for understanding God, which I will refer to as energy or as a lot of different things, just something outside of the white dude on the cross. I still the, the use the construct universe. of yeah. God and Jesus and the tr- and like because I know is it, it. Jesus like, though? It's so Jesus much- is it? Yeah. You ever read the uh, book of <laughs> Fresh Off the Boat by Eddie Wong? Um, he was he, is the um, show based on that. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a show based on his book. But yeah. anyway, um, uh, in the book he outlines how like you know he he's not he wasn't raised Christian, but then he went to a Christian school like, mm-hmm. like later down the line, and him not knowing any Christian um, uh, stories or context like just not having been raised in it like he he steps into this world where people believe that you know a guy uh raised from the dead walked on water and turned water into wine. And he and he was like you know, seven or eight at the time. He's just looking at all the kids like, "Are y'all stupid? <laughs> like, do you hear yourselves?" Because like he he wasn't raised to believe that, you know. Like he was raised, you know, uh, maybe Buddhist. I think. Because yeah, I don't think I think how you you relate to empathy and compassion is how you relate to it. I think in that example, one thing that's interesting is like you have a knowledge, like mm. you know more right. about him. Like if you yeah. were just an outside observer, and you're like, "This dude's fucking high," and he's rambling. Like I don't have time for this. Like, I think that's where the compassion comes in. Because, like, you could choose to be compassionate towards that high dude because you don't know what's going on in their life. And without needing to know what's going on in their life, you can choose to still treat them like a human being. Yeah. Um, where the empathy comes in is, like, after you've done that, maybe you get to know them a little bit. And you're like, oh, shit, you got run over by an econo line? Like, mm. tell me more about that. Like, mm. okay, I can feel w- that. Like, yeah. But I can feel that. that, yeah. Like, if me and Kuya is, are is out. Sitting in the ditch together, right? Yeah, word. If, like, me and Kuya go somewhere, right, to a festival where we're working, like, out in the field, um, Kuya knows, and, like, my wife, to a great degree, knows, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, Daniel's fucked up. He needs to sit down. You know what I'm saying? Like, Daniel has back issues that we can't push the limits of, and you learn to do that innately. Again, like, empathy and compassion, ultimately, uh, I think as much as they they have, yeah, I don't, and ultimately what it is is, again, uh, tools to build community and, like, Mm. Uh, help each other like that's the goal of everything yeah, really that's right? the commonality people. i mean like yeah. your community is very specifically focused around poetry but even in that like i think there's a broader mission because we mentioned how much of their or therapy how much of poetry is about therapy yeah and whether it's individual or helping others grow from your own experience mm-hmm. put down on word like we're trying to grow a community and by just helping with the broader idea of compassion so i like there's a lot of there's a lot of threads. So hey, yeah, a lot of threads, threads and lines. Penultimate. So not only I mean you said there were layers to how you're trying to proliferate poetry and and like the overall vision. One of the big things that you guys executed on masterfully, I, I thankfully was able to support was um, the marrying of the the visual and the the word. Um, poetry Art Gallery, woo. yeah, the 2019. Art gallery, gallery. How much time do we got? I can like, I got a tongue load <laughs> yeah, about this. This is, this is really, really a lot. Like, if you let Kuya go on this, this Whoa. is an. Oh my we're gonna rein him. We're gonna rein him in. But like, my specific question is like, visual poetry, yes. and like, I love my poster. I can, I'm, I'm still. I gotta get a frame so I can put it up. It's gonna be in my back when I do videos from now. But it's like, um, I probably need a bigger one. But like, what does visual poetry mean to you? Hey, really Why? quick, before you do your whole thing, because I you are going to yeah. handle all of this. My whole goal with Pen Click was I grew up in, like, the punk rock hip-hop community, and I was like, yo, y'all want to come to the poetry shit? And they were like, out of here with that boring, stupid poetry shit. No one wants to go to see you do poetry shit. Yeah, you're cool. I like seeing you do it, but you could do it right here in my living room for me, and I don't got to watch <laughs> 12 other boring it, people. No cover. Yeah, I don't want to do that. So my mission this whole time was how do we do shit that I can bring those homies to? How do we do shit that I can bring my trap, ignorant, struggling ass, fucking dumb homies to that they're going to be like, yo, that was cool. though. That was Uh, poetry, but that was cool. Enter the connector, the entertainer, the (laughs) the visual. Yeah, yeah. So I'm creative director, all that shit. Um, So uh, uh, in this day and age, right, um, uh, there's so um, our generation, like millennials and Gen Z, they're they're investing so much in experiential forms of entertainment, Mm -hmm. right? And um, and understandably so because like there are things that can only be experienced in certain ways or another. So um, one thing that uh, that like a lot of people who are just listening to audio won't get from a live you know um, in theater performance of a, of a slam poem is like is like is like the body language like like the, mm. like the the crowd snapping you know like just like the volume of of the of the voice. You can only capture so much in camera, right? 
Um, so, um, same thing with like reading a poem, right? Like, like uh, you in, like, um, when you're reading a, the difference between stage poetry and page poetry. In um, uh, page poetry, you can reread as many times as you want until you find whatever deeper meaning. Uh, stage poetry, uh, because that's a live event, uh, the listeners can only listen to it then and there. If they if the, if a line goes over their head, they don't get it, mm-hmm. right? So that's so th- so there's a so there's different ways of experiencing well, stage poetry. Isn't part of the poetry. meaning done through intonation? Right, and, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So so um, um so so there's that part as well. Um, as far as the oral delivery goes, right. but um, in an age where we have social media and and all and, uh, democratized of uh, uh, tools of creativity, um, be, you know these free design tools, whatever, whatever, like there is um visual so so. On paper, visual poem. A visual poem is a piece of uh, is a visual piece that communicates a poem. So that could be just text, but all the words are spaced out in a very special way. If it's if it's uh, if it's a poem about raindrops, imagine the text all uh, dropping down um, down the page like in in various uh, uh, spacing and letting, and that's trying to communicate visually, like uh, you know, raindrops falling. Which we're right? seeing more than ever because of Instagram, right? And then there's right. other there's other but types of visual trash. Poems. There's, there's 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 other types of visual Sometimes. poems being being like you know blackout poetry. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah. But um but myself uh, so the idea for the poetry art gallery comes from uh, my background as an art director in entertainment advertising. In entertainment advertising, when we're talking when we're advertising a movie, a TV show, we do these things called quote cards. When you look at um when you follow your favorite show on social media, they have these like you know images of a person and a quote that they said, right? Or 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 an image of an image of of an actor and this critic quote that says, "Oh, best movie of the year." Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Rocky Johnson was the best in uh, he he threw the biggest punch in this crazy Fast and Furious movie, whatever, yep. right? Um, and then like the then the text is rendered like if it's an action movie, maybe there's sparks that are flying across the text, or or there's or the text is like fully chrome, maybe the text is made out of threads, whatever, whatever. So. The difference between art and design is that art is for the individual to interpret. Design is for the millions to understand. Oh. Understand that. So when we are designing, uh, you, uh, we're trying to get people to understand things like within a split second um, that they see a billboard and they see a hamburger and it says um, exit right. That means that like within that split second I saw a hamburger and it said exit right. Oh, that must mean that there's a hamburger place when I exit the freeway, Right. So, um, uh, so with that in mind, taking the idea of design and forging that with poetry. Poetry is uh, is uh, is um, literary art. It's trying to, um, you know, like have you interpret a certain feel. But design is trying to communicate that feel. It's trying to make you feel that oh, this this is about like uh, this is about colorism. This is about you know uh, um, a woman's uh, insecurities about this issue, right? So I thought that. Um, in the era of social media where we're trying to get hella clicks for or hella likes for, sure. um, for visual pieces and, ha- and trying to create the most um, approachable way for people to experience poetry in this visual platform, uh, we should cater our, uh, we should be able to you know, marry poetry and visual design into one art form, mm-hmm. uh, you know, specifically, you know, not only because that's what the, these visual platforms want, this is what people are looking for, but also anybody can, uh, you know, anybody can appreciate good design and a great poster, right? So you, you'll see a dope poster, but yo, that looks dope. And then you read the words that are on it, like, oh, is this, like, are those words on it? Is this a story? And then you read it's a poem. I was like, oh, there's that second hit. So the visual is the candy. And then, and then you know, it's, you know, it's, it's sugar coating the medicine, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that is kind of the mission, like trying to package poetry in new and engaging ways, ways. to where you see a poster and you're like, mm. like he's described that whole process. And then imagine that person reads that poem and they're like, holy fuck, I don't think I've ever read a poem in my whole life. On the flip side, so that's trying to like, you know, make poetry more approachable for the audience. For the, the value for the poet is that you can turn those into merch. So we're yeah. trying to show poets that, yo, like, like, it doesn't have to be just chapbooks. Well, you don't have to be a broke book poet. Yeah, you don't have to be a and broke we poet. we don't have to follow this old paradigm where it's like you sell your chapbook or you sell your book and that's the only thing you do. Make you know prints. Saying? Like, no, fuck that. Make stickers, make prints, make magnets. Make shirts. Feed yourself like Back other to visual graphic live designers their dreams. are doing. Right. It's like, yeah, let's do so which So is it, the only thing that came to mind while you were talking was like democratizing poetry. I don't, I think that's too simplified, but it, like it's, 
it's making it accessible. It makes it that's the accessible. good. Yeah. That's our ultimate goal and because poetry is already dope. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah. And the we market want is never wrong. Sh- we want to show yeah. the market that too. We want to show like well, brands like, yo, poets could do it like this. I could too. argue that. All right, please yeah. do. All right, so, so here's, here's the thing, right? All right, so um, uh, if your product is good, but you're not, but you're not getting buys, then there's a pro- there's a problem with distribution. But if if the if the distribution part is already solved, then uh, and then like maybe and people are still aren't buying your product, then maybe your product's not that great, right? So that's so that's what uh, what uh, what is meant by the market is never wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I get it on that level. We could keep going because I have so many more things written down that I want to ask you. Right. But Keith, are you, you good? You want me to do it? Yeah, no, it's it. Final question. What do y'all want to leave our listeners with? And you could do it individually or you could do it joint. I don't know however y'all want to do it. Shit. Uh, love yourself. Uh, to be you is the only true act of revolution and rebellion. Microwave your blunts. 2020. R.I.P. Nipsey. West Coast, Best Coast. Hey. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. But write a poem. Go check out Pen Click. Yeah. Love each other. Be nice, motherfucker. <laughs> Let's see. Um, you got to find out what it ain't to find out what it is. So too often in life, um, we, I, we, we fail on certain, on certain endeavors. But all we're finding is that that's, that's just not how to do it. We have to find out what it is. And this uh, philosophy carries into every aspect of life, be it design, art, parenting, whatever, whatever. That's one thing that I learned from. That's one thing I learned from engineering, where like uh, you're trying to isolate the system to find out where is like the incorrect right. um, output, yeah. right? You um you got to find out what it ain't to find out what it I is. I can troubleshoot anything. Exactly, yeah, and that goes into into art and design, where like this client doesn't like this color palette. Well, now we know what it ain't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and then that, that that goes on into like you know maybe your dating life is like if you're if you're dating nothing but fuck boys, um, and they're all breaking your heart. Well, then like maybe you should stop dating fuck boys. You know what I'm saying? Or find the right fuck boy, whatever. Um, mm. but you got to find out what it ain't to find out what it is. And forgive um, yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. Exactly. You're gonna fuck up a lot. Everybody's gonna make a lot of mistakes. Like every process is a process, right? You, I, I you listener, you deserve to be loved. Everyone should experience that in life because that is one of the few life experiences that is like that makes life worth living. You exp- you deserve to be loved, um, and if you're not re- if you're not ready for that journey, that's fine. You have time. You can find love, you know, like you know, well into you know into your senior years. That's fine. Like, like you gotta find out what it ain't to find out what it is. So you gotta find, you know, you, you sometimes you gotta as a t uh, the Turn poet, like a t- dating show <laughs> as, 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 as the poet Tiana Francis said. Um, sometimes you have to wade through bugs to find out butterflies. All right. right? Mm. Um, and yeah, check out PenClick, the most popping poetry podcast in the galaxy. On planet. P-E-N-C-L-I-Q-U-E on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. We are at the PenClick because there is a South African uh, uh, a website that no longer exists that hasn't tweeted since 2012 that still holds on to the tweet name. Yo, I have lock, locked down on Afrohost, the, 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 uh, the Afrohost, uh, Afro Afrohost, which is like the, the South African hosting service. So, yo, can you can we please get penclick.com? Can we please get penclick the username on Twitter? I'm like, oh, sorry, this person has it on auto pay, so you kind of asked out unless they get off of auto pay. So, yo, check your auto pay. Make sure that you're not paying for unnecessary shit. Thanks. And follow us at Pink. Thank you.